Surprise, everybody! I didn't know I was the surprise. I would have come out of a cake or something like that if I knew I was the surprise. And I was almost surprising there in and of itself. So just bear with me while I uh, get my life organized up here. Everybody well today? Yeah. It's good to be well when there's no snow on the ground in January. So that's all right. Except on the ski hills for you skiers. Don't worry, we came by. Is that Chicopee you can see from 85? There's still snow at Chicopee, so don't worry. You skiers, you will be okay. You can hit the slopes at your leisure and enjoy. Well, anybody glad to know Jesus? All right. Well, I'm just uh, swapping places with Mike. He's in Niagara today where we, where my family and I come from, and I'm here, so that's all right. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to be with you. Anybody got your Bible? Yes. You have your Bible? Let's go to that first screen here. Have you got that ready? The Bible? Oh, there it is. Then their eyes were opened. <laughs> you ever had that experience? Yeah. You thought that was going to happen to you when you saw the surprise this morning, but that didn't happen, right? <laughs> Then their eyes were opened. Then their eyes were opened. We'll get there in a minute or two. Let's pray together. Father, today we're thankful for your love, thankful for your compassion, thankful for your favor, for every good and every perfect gift that has come to you, for you are the loving Father. And we're glad to uh, have the opportunity to know you through our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us today, O Lord, to have our eyes open to the right things, the things that you would have us see, the things that you would have us understand. And Father, even kind of on the reverse side of our topic today, may our eyes be closed and our consideration withdrawn from things that you would not have us consider. So we thank you for your help today that the Holy Spirit is our teacher in the Word of God and that you are the source of every good thing in our lives. We thank you for it today. It's in Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. Amen. Then their eyes were opened. If you're going to open your Bible, go ahead and open to Genesis chapter 3. That's pretty easy to find. Just turn a little bit in. Genesis chapter 3. Kind of an easy start today. Very familiar passage of Scripture. We won't have to go too far, so most people here will know what we're talking about as soon as we read. If you don't have a Bible and you want to grab one, I think there are some around the room. If you just want to follow along on the screen, that's certainly fine as well. We have them up here with us today as well. Who are we reading about in Genesis 3? Oh, you're not asleep already, are you? A surprise put you to sleep? Who are we reading about? We're reading about Eve, but also about... Oh, wait a second. Who else are we reading about? Oh, most of you just read the woman. He said, yeah, blame it on the woman. Well, wait a minute. Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says when she took the fruit, she ate it, and she gave some to the guy who was with her. Sometimes the guys like to think Adam was on the other side of the garden, working diligently. <laughs> Not knowing that his wife was over yonder plunging the world into darkness. No, 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 no. What did the scripture say? It says she ate and went, here you go. Right? He was just as dumb. Maybe even dumber. Because he was the one who had heard directly from the Lord, this is not what you're supposed to be doing. Right? So there's just a little introduction for you. Not just Eve, we're reading about Adam and Eve, of course. Let's go ahead and read here. So when the woman saw that the tree was good, well, who else was there? The tempter was there, right? Who had come to call them to question what God had said. And so the tempter has come. Satan himself has come. And, said, and so we read, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Let's keep going. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, did God know what had happened? Yes. Is he fully aware? Yes. Does it change him at all? No. He still shows up. Hey, where are you? Where are you? Come on, let's be together. Here we go. And they heard the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. I hid myself. This is what you call sin. 
And the scripture later, later goes on, the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, would tell us that by one man, sin entered the world. Is that what the Bible says? That's what it does. Sin entered the world and death through sin, and it spread to everybody. By one. Was it your fault? No. Was it my fault? No. Was it the sinner's fault? Was it the neighbor who you think is, is just needing to come to church? No, it wasn't their fault either. That doesn't change the fact that there's a problem, but it does save you and me from thinking we have to point out everybody's mistakes. Sin and death entered by one person and spread to everybody, came to us all. So we see Adam and Eve, then their eyes were opened to a problem, a big problem, a problem we can't get out of, a problem we have no way of escaping. We say, well, well, you know, God later gave them the commandments. Doesn't that help them? No. Some of you know what those commandments did. They came and put gas on the fire, so to speak. What does the scripture say? The law or the commandments were given not to give us the solution, but to really help us see this problem is out of control. This problem is beyond our capacity to solve. This problem is in, or we are in this problem over our heads and we can't swim and we don't have water wings. We're done. We're cooked. So the commandments aren't going to help. They're just going to make the problem bigger. The only positive side of the commandments is that some of us would eventually clue in and say, yeah, we're in this thing too deep. We're not getting out of here. We need some help. Then their eyes were opened to a vast problem. And what did they immediately do? What did Adam and Eve immediately do when they discovered a problem? I'm naked. So what did they do? Let's do some sewing. They covered themselves. What does that speak of? Trying to make yourself presentable. Trying to hide your shame. Hoping, well, this is the best I can do. See, what sin did was not just lead us to call out for a Savior. First, it did this. It brought guilt. It brought shame. It brought fear of God and quickly led to an effort to keep up appearances and make self presentable. Do you know, religion has not changed at all. Isn't that what religion is? Whatever religion you want to choose, whatever name you give it, even if it doesn't have a name, it's an attempt to cover up one's shame and make self presentable and keep up appearances. How am I doing? Well, my hair looks better than yours. My shoes are shinier than yours. Oh, I heard what you did this week. I didn't do that. How am I doing? Not knowing that we're already all in the deep end and we're all already drowning. And God, in fact, already declared, it's over. I say it this way, the curtain came up on Adam and Eve center stage and the curtain went back down before I ever had a chance to get in the show. It was over already. It was done. You didn't even get your part. It was over. By one man sin entered the world and death through sin and death spread to everybody. Then their eyes were open to a problem and immediately they were sowing and trying to keep up appearances, trying to make self presentable, overwhelmed by a problem, they hid themselves. But God didn't change. God came to them. Oh, I love how it's written. In the cool of the day. Isn't that wonderful? Sounds nice. It's like, but they just sinned. Shouldn't have been coming with a hammer or something. No, he came as always. In the cool of the day, their eyes were opened, but God's response was the same. Ready for another story? Let's go to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Let's go there. Luke 24, the latter part of the chapter. Luke 24. We'll read there in a, few, in a, in a little bit here. Many of you know this story. You say, well, we just got, oh, I didn't wish you a happy new year. Happy new year, by the way. Year. 2013 treating you okay? Broncos fans, you'll be okay. I thought, I was looking at the kids here sitting in front of me, and I thought, this one guy's calling out for the Ravens to win, and three chairs down, there's a Wes Welker Patriots jersey. I thought, Sunday school is going to get ugly today, but they'll be okay, <laughs> right? Because if the Patriots win today, guess what happens next Sunday? Welker's going to be back, and the Ravens are going to be back, and 
better go home early or something. Hopefully there's a nice lunch after church, maybe. There can be peace in the valley or something like that. How did I get there? Oh, I was wishing you a happy new year because I thought, oh, we just passed Christmas and now in Luke 24, we're on to Easter already, but that's okay. In Luke 24, you find a story. Jesus is dead, or they think he's dead. And they've had their, you know, two days worth of, well, we don't know about this Jesus guy anymore. We're certainly sad when he was killed because, you know, we were thinking that he was the mighty prophet who was going to redeem Israel. And so in Luke 24, picking up where we're going to read, we find two people, quite likely a man and a wife, by the way. We're only told the name of one. His name was Cleopas. But in all likelihood, it's probably a man and a wife because they're journeying together to a place that evidently they're familiar with and they can walk right in and sit down and start preparing dinner. Sounds like two people going home to me. Can't prove it to you exclusively, but quite possibly. So we find two people walking on a seven-mile journey. That's a pretty good walk. Any of you walk seven miles today? No. But they're walking from Jerusalem back to a place called Emmaus. And the story says they were walking and they were discussing the things that had happened in the recent days concerning the death of Jesus. And who shows up? Oh, come on. Have you read this story before? Who showed up? Jesus. Jesus. Did they recognize him right away? No. It says their eyes were restrained. And he just shows up and says, why are you so sad as you walk? It's seven miles, we're tired. No, that's not what they said. They said, <laughs> they said to Jesus, are you a stranger here? The Scott McIntyre translation goes, what are you, new? <laughs> and they say to him, don't you know what has happened? He says, what, what things? About Jesus. We were hoping he was the one who would save Israel. But it's now, he's, he's, he's been killed. Didn't you hear that the chief priests and scribes, they handed him over to the Romans and they convinced Pilate to condemn him to death and in fact, he was killed. And then they say this, interesting part of the story, they say this, and today is the third day. Do you know what they're saying? We're assuming that they're two Jewish people. They're saying this, even a loophole in our religion is running out of time. Do you remember the story of Lazarus? When Jesus finally arrived, and Martha says to him, it's the fourth day. Jesus says, take away the stone from the tomb. And she says, hold on, he's been in there four days, he stinks. <laughs> well, it's over then, forget it. No, that's not what Jesus said. <laughs> but you see, the Jews had a loophole in their religion. See, resurrection was not foreign to them. If you've read the Old Testament, you know there were people who were raised from the dead. True? True. And did Jesus himself not go to a little town called Nain and ruin a perfectly good funeral? <laughs> right? Yes. What? You've been to funerals. You know nothing ruins a funeral faster than the resurrection of the dead person. <laughs> Party's over. Serve the sandwiches. Let's get on with it. Right? So resurrection is not foreign. Right? Elijah, the prophet, raised the young boy from the dead at, at uh, Zarephath, I believe it was. Remember that? There was resurrection. So it's not completely foreign to them. Right? And so the problem being this, though, they were believing at that time that once the person died, if three days passes, that person's spirit will finally depart. The spirit may linger for a few days near the place that he was buried, and hopefully he'll come back. But by the time Jesus gets to Lazarus, Martha says, four days, he stinks, it's over. And the, and the, two, the two people on the road to Emmaus, they say to Jesus, it's the third day since he died. We're running out of time. We're thinking it's over. And then you know what Jesus said? He said, Oh, there, there. No, that's not what he said. He said, oh, foolish! Come on, we're sad. He died. No, foolish and slow to believe in all that the prophets have said. Oh, Jesus, meek and mild, so comforting. He says, foolish. What's wrong with you? Why are you so slow of heart to believe what has been said? And then he takes them on what I guarantee you was the most outstanding Bible study that has yet to happen. The scripture says they continued to walk, and he started at Moses. Well, where did Moses start? Moses wrote what you just read on the screen in Genesis. So we would say it this way. He started with them in Genesis, 
And he took them through the scriptures and he expounded everything that concerned him. Would you like to be in that Bible study? That's a pretty good study where he started at Moses and took them all the way through the prophets. And maybe he opened and said, look at this lovely psalm that David wrote. The Lord is my shepherd. Guess who's your shepherd? That's me. Look what Isaiah wrote. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his stripes we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, but the Lord has bruised him in our place. That's me. What a Bible study. And he leads them. No, they got seven miles. They got lots of time, right? So they can have this Bible study. He's expounding to them not just the great doctrines of the Old Testament, but he's saying, what you're so used to reading is pointing to me. Don't be slow to believe. Look at me. Finding Jesus. He's giving them a true study of what God is pointing to people, pointing to, uh, bringing to our attention even in the Old Testament. Okay, let's read. Here we go. But they can... Oh, sorry. The next part of the story, they arrive at their destination. And what does Jesus do? He says, well, nice to be with you. I'm, I'm going to carry on. He says he acted as though he was going farther. And they said, no, 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 no. Please, please, please. They constrained him, saying, abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened. Ooh, did you read that? Did you read that somewhere before? Okay. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Keep going. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. Seven miles again, by the way. They returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together. Next one saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Say it with me. Then their eyes were opened. Then their eyes were opened. Ah, to what? Adam and Eve had their eyes opened to a problem. These two friends, Cleopas and his wife possibly, or Cleopas and whoever the other person was, then their eyes were opened. Remember, they've had quite a Bible study. Talk about being equipped for the ministry. Then their eyes were opened to the solution. Now, I'm not going to give you a great doctrine here. I'm not making this a, a biblical doctrine that you can, you can credit to my name and saying, he came up with this doctrine. No, forget that. But how many of you appreciate that in, in kind of the, the subtle ways that God can help us put things together in His Word? What happened to Adam and Eve? They ate the fruit. Then their eyes were opened. Shame, guilt, fear of God, the need to keep up appearances, whatever the result was, their eyes were opened to something they hadn't seen before. It wasn't good. But here we have God coming to them and saying, let's be together. Well, now we have two friends on the road to Emmaus. God came to Adam and Eve. What happened to the friends on the road to Emmaus? God came to them. And with God coming to them, then their eyes were opened to something good. These eyes were open to the problem. These eyes are open to the solution. And when did it happen? Here's how God helps us. Maybe, uh, maybe this in the future will help us remember. How many of you know this expression? The cool of the day. The cool, doesn't that sound nice? You say, when is that? Is that at 6 o'clock in the morning? When is it? Well, let's have a look here. The story in Luke says that it was toward evening and the day is far spent. In the cool of the day, have a look here. The cool of the day, it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. Strong's Concordance says this, that the expression, the cool of the day, means the gentle, refreshing evening breeze, so well known in the Near East. Anybody been to kind of Israel, or the, the, the Middle East as we call it? Anybody been there? Maybe you've been there on an evening time. I don't know what the breeze is like, maybe you do. But he says, the cool of the breeze refers to the evening breeze known well in the Near East. Adam's, Adam Clark says this in his commentary, the decline of the day or in the evening breeze. And a man named John Gill says this, in the evening at sun setting. 
Adam and Eve's eyes were open to a problem. But in the cool of the day, at the setting of the sun, God came. The two friends on the road to Emmaus, as the day was drawing to a close, in the cool of the day, they had their eyes opened. One, eye, one set of eyes were opened to the great problem. The next set of eyes were opened to the great solution. Let's bring us into the story. It is essential that our eyes be open to the right thing. Adam and Eve had one. Their eyes were opened to the problem. They didn't have another option at that time. The friends on the road to Emmaus, we are similar to them. They had already known the problem. It was declared to them in their scriptures. Now they've got the solution. We're in the same boat. We've come to recognize the problem. We've come to recognize the solution. The challenge for us is, which one are we looking at? Yes? At any moment of every day, in whatever situation you find yourself in, which one are you looking at? Are you looking at you stuck in the problem? Or are you looking at you united with Jesus apart from the problem? The problem having been overcome. It is essential that our eyes are open to the right thing. You say, Adam became aware of sin. He did. But you know what else he became aware of? Self. He became aware of self. I mean, oh, being aware of self isn't always so good. Because at some point in time, you got to be honest with self. And sometimes self isn't so good. And so if we bring ourselves into thinking and, and considering our relationship with God, if self is forefront, we're going to do the same thing that Adam and Eve did. How am I doing? Are my shoes done up properly? All right, have I said the right things? Have I, have I, have I made sure my T's are crossed and my eyes are dotted? Am I wearing the right apparel? Oh, everybody else is raising their hands. Are my hands going up? Everybody else is bowed in their eyes. Are my eyes closed? How am I doing? If self is given the priority, we're going to end up in the same boat. Keeping up appearances, trying to make self presentable, not knowing or maybe not recognizing that it's a trap that goes nowhere. It's a road that gets you no place. Our eyes are open. What are they open to? Are our eyes open to sin and self, or are our eyes open to Christ? And not only are they to be open to Him, they're to be open to the fact that in God's sight, wherever Christ is, and whatever His standing is, and whatever God's opinion of Him is, it counts for you as well. Amen? So am I seeing myself united with Adam in sin and selfishness and, and self-awareness? Or am I seeing myself united with Christ in righteousness, holiness, and every good thing that God would need of me? Which one are we looking at? Where are we giving our attention? Luke 24, we read the word that says, When Jesus broke the bread, then they knew him. They knew him. That term knew, when you look at it in its original word, it means to perceive or to recognize. And what did the two disciples do when they recognized him? He disappeared. They got up and said, let's go back to Jerusalem and tell them what we've seen. Because that word to know or they knew him means this, their knowing or their perception inspired action. I mean, you know, as you come to know Jesus, it inspires action in you. I'm not talking necessarily about it causes you to go knock on your neighbor's door and blab your gospel at them and call them to repent and say the prayer with me. That's a good byproduct maybe down the road. But first of all, the action it inspires is for you to reconsider you. Right? It gives you new thoughts about yourself. Does the scripture speak about that transformation by the renewing of the mind? As you consider Jesus, you are inspired to action even within yourself and you gain a new self-perception. You gain a new understanding that I'm not stuck needing to keep up appearances. I'm not stuck needing to make myself presentable. I'm not stuck trapped in guilt and shame and trying to hide from God. No, I've been united with Jesus. The guilt that used to be in me was set aside. The shame that I used to think I needed to feel, God is not concerned about it. I'm united with Jesus. You say, that's going to make me arrogant. I'm just going to think good things about myself. Well, be honest with yourself. Is any of it extended to you apart from God's mercy? 
It's all extended to you because of His mercy. The mercy of God. I think I've shared this with you before. I appreciate God's mercy because it brings me from infinitely negative to zero. I say, zero? What do you mean? It does. That's what mercy does. It brings you from infinitely negative in God's sight to zero. But there's something that goes along with mercy. It's called grace. Mercy brought you from infinitely negative to zero. The Bible says this, the grace of God brings you from zero to all things for life and godliness. Amen. That's what the Apostle Peter said. Through the knowledge of Christ Jesus, God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. I'm not stuck in shame. I'm not stuck in defeat. I'm not stuck in guilt. It has nothing to do with me. I can claim no good thing in and of myself. I can only say that God extended good things to me in the person of Jesus, and God extended good things to you in the person of Jesus. And the question for you and for me at any moment of any day is, do you want you to count for you, or do you want him to count for you? How many of you want Jesus to count for you? And he does. That's what salvation is. That he counts rather than me. You say, well, does that mean I'm counting for nothing? Well, hold on. What does John 3, 16 say? God so loved the world. Never forget that. We sing songs like, it's all about Jesus. And it is. But you know, from God's perspective, it's all about you. This whole salvation thing. Jesus gains nothing by coming here for himself. He's the eternal word of God, and he will be tomorrow, he will be the next day, he will be forever. But you gain something by him coming. And God recovers something by him coming. Doesn't add anything to his status. He's good to go. But I need help. He delivers mercy. He delivers grace. I want him to count for me. Anybody else say that? And he does. His righteousness credited to you, His holiness credited to you, every good thing that He is in the sight of God, being God Himself, of course. It counts for you. That's called salvation. Amen. Even His death counted for... Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Don't let me ruin the rest of the sermon. Everybody okay so far? All right, we're doing all right. We are to recognize Jesus, His perfection, His finished work, and what He has done on our behalf. And what happens? Faith rises in us. You ever tried to have faith? You might as well put your head in a bench vice and tighten it up, right? It's hard to have faith. Especially when people are telling you, God requires that you have faith. Well, he does. But you know what he did? He sent Jesus. And the book of Hebrews calls him the author or originator and the finisher of faith. So what is faith for you? Give your attention to Jesus. Look at his mercy. Look at his grace. And God looks at that and says, that looks like faith to me. You're considering Christ. Give your attention to Jesus. And you'll find that faith is not a project. It is a byproduct of who you're giving your attention to. Amen? Now we can see the importance of something like Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 2 where Paul is praying for the believers and he prays this, just like our friends in, in, on the road to Emmaus, their eyes were opened. The Apostle Paul prays this, Lord, may their eyes be enlightened that they would know the hope that you have given to them in Jesus. Lord, may their eyes be opened that they would see your power working for them and through them. Lord, may their eyes be open to know that they have been freed from sin, to know that your grace has freed them from sin. And I love what he says in Ephesians 2. God gives you the reason why he did it. Where God says that Jesus was raised from the dead, and God saw that as your resurrection. God caused Jesus to be raised up and he made him sit together with him in the heavenly places. But God's not doing that for Jesus. God is seeing you given a spot in God's family and God's house. And the Bible says the reason for that is that forever still to come. That's not a long time, by the way. Forever is forever. Forget about time. Throw your watch away. That forever still to come. God would busy himself making known to you the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness 
toward you. Some of you have never thought of God like that. The person who lives next door to you has never thought of God like that. The people of Waterloo have never thought of God like that. That his priority for forever would be to make known to them the exceeding riches of his undeserved favor and his kindness. Wow. God's goal is that you would know his kindness, that you would know his grace, that you would be a vessel of his grace and his kindness. I didn't say it. It's written in his own book that forever still to come, we would come to know the riches of his grace by knowing his kindness. Amen. Amen. So what are my eyes open to? What are your eyes open to? A couple more stories we're going to refer here today. We don't have them on the screen. We'll look at the screen a little bit later. What are you considering? What are you giving your attention to? What are you looking to? You know, there's a story way back in the book of Numbers. Maybe we can go to that next one. The one with, uh, with Moses. Oh, there he is. The serpent on the pole. Wow. I wouldn't have wanted to have been there that day. I don't know about you, but if you've read that story, that is not a place for Scott to visit, that's for sure. The scripture says that the people of Israel were rebelling and complaining against God, and so fiery serpents came among them and bit them. And everybody said, hallelujah, I wish I was there. Not a chance. <laughs> and they say to Moses, please pray for us, Moses. So Moses prayed. And God said, make a bronze fiery serpent and put it on a pole. Okay. And everybody who looks at the serpent on the pole, everybody who gazes at the serpent on the pole with a consistent expectation, anybody who will look upon my goodness being made known through, this, through the serpent on the pole, they'll be healed. How many of you read the story? You know this one? And the scripture says Moses obeyed. He made the brazen serpent and he put it on the pole. And anybody in the nation of Israel who looked at that serpent on the pole, they were healed of the bites. And they weren't bitten anymore. Praise God for that. The serpent on the pole. Well, wait a minute. This is where it gets kind of funny. If you read through the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, who do you usually associate with the serpent? Satan. Satan. He came in the form of the serpent in the first story we read. But Jesus comes to us in John chapter 3, and he says this. Even as Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness, so also the Son of Man shall be lifted up. Wait a second, Jesus. No, 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 no. You got the doctrine wrong. Everybody knows the serpent is Satan. What are you saying? It's you. Because that's what he was saying. Saying, just as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, even so I, the Son of Man, will be lifted up. No, you got it wrong. No, he got it right. And what do you see here? The serpent was hung. On the pole. <gasps> what are you saying? Come on, Jesus is the good guy, not the bad guy. That's right. But guess who the bad guy was? Don't say the devil. That's not the right answer. The bad guy was me. I'll let you speak for yourself. The logic of the New Testament is that when Jesus went to the cross, the serpent went to the cross. He didn't go there as him or for him. He went there as you and me, for you and me. Is that what the Bible teaches? It is, isn't it? That sin died at the cross. That Satan, yes, he was disarmed. Why was he disarmed? Because sin was put away. So the serpent was hung on the pole. The problem of sin and death was hung on the pole and it was left there defeated. It was left there helpless. It was left there unable to harm you. Keep your eyes in the right spot. Keep your eyes off the problem of sin and death. Keep your eyes on what Jesus did in putting the serpent to death and rising again, leaving the old you behind, leaving the old sin behind, leaving the sin record marked paid in full, forget about it, and giving you new life so that when Jesus comes out of the grave, God doesn't see him, he sees you and says there's new creation, new life for you. It is righteousness, it is peace, it is joy in the Holy Spirit, it is everything I would require of you. It comes not of yourself, it is the gift 
gift of God. You can't boast. I will boast in what I have done through the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will look at him and you will boast about him, not you. Amen? Because I'm joined with him. You are joined with him. What did we say before? He counts for you. Why? Because God so loved the world. Adam counted for you originally. Problem. Jesus counts for you today and forevermore. Solution. Everything's okay. Everything is okay. Give your eyes to Jesus. Look to him with that steady gaze. Look to him and all that he has done on your behalf. Everybody okay? Amen. We've got to go one more spot here today. You read in the book of Numbers. Just hold that picture right there for now. Just leave that one just as it is. You read in the book of Numbers about the serpent on the pole that Moses made. Do you know that's not where the story ends? That's not where the story ends. The story finally ends with Jesus being the fulfillment of the symbol of what Moses did. But in the interval, let me check my notes to make sure I have the reference right. About 600, maybe on towards 700 years after Moses, the bronze serpent is still around. They still had it. Now I got a few less head nods. Maybe some of you don't know this story. Because you've got to read about the kings. Anybody read the book of Kings where it gets really confusing? I have trouble remembering who the good kings were and the bad kings. I know, that Ahaz, I know that Ahab was bad and Manasseh was really bad. And I know that Joash and Josiah and Hezekiah, they were all pretty good. As good as you can be. And I of course know that David was good and he got into a bit of trouble. And Solomon was good and then he completely fell off the cliff towards the end. But... Other than that, there's a lot of kings, and if you name me a king and say good or bad, I'll say, I have no clue. But here we're going to happen to read about a good king. Not Wenceslas, don't worry, that's Christmas time, just leave that alone for now. We're going to read about a good king. Because the story of the bronze serpent didn't end with Moses. Six or seven hundred years later, that bronze serpent is still around. So here's the question. What later happened to the serpent on the pole that was made by Moses? 2 Kings chapter 18. Let's go there. Here we go. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, everybody say, good king? As good as you can be. Still a sinner, still needs Jesus. But as far as being king, he was better than most. Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. Here we go. Next one. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. Here it goes. He removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars. He cut down the wood, wooded image and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. Well, that sounds like a scary name. <laughs> they called it Nehushtan. And what did they do? They burned incense to it. In other words, what did they do with it? They made it into an idol. And what did Hezekiah do? Did they say, praise God for the symbol of our salvation? No, he smashed it. Get rid of it. Nehushtan is what they called it. Now this is funny. You might think that the word means the great symbol that we're so thankful for, that the Lord provided deliverance for our ancestors when they were lost. And in spite of themselves in the wilderness, God is good. You know what Nehushtan means? Next screen, please. The bronze thing. Are you serious? That's what it means. They called it The bronze thing. <laughs> what are you guys doing today? Uh, stop by and see the bronze thing. And... I'll go for a bite afterwards? Yeah, okay. The bronze thing. They burned incense to it. It became an object of their worship with evidently absolutely no significance at all. 
Well, why do you do that? We just do. Daddy did it. Granddaddy did it. Great granddaddy did it. Great, 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 great granddaddy did it. Why do you do it? Saturday morning. It's what we do. The bronze thing. Now, was the bronze thing originally a good thing for Israel? Yeah, when Moses made it, it was essential. Look at it and live, people. But years passed. And that which was originally ordained of God, for God told Moses to build it, it was commissioned by God, it served a purpose of God, it became, or we might say it this way, it was made a bronze thing. Do we still have bronze things today? You might want to put your feet under your chair for a minute or two. Don't worry, I'm not going to stomp too hard here. What about something like prayer? Was it ordained of God? Oh, yeah. Is it a good thing from God? Yes. Is it possible that it could become a bronze thing? Just a religious ritual? Say it at dinner time. 30 seconds before I fall asleep at night. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my toys to break so nobody can... No, that's the kid's version. No, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. That's what it is. Right? Could it become a bronze thing with no real significance in our thinking? What about something like confessing God's Word? Some of you have heard teaching on those lines. Now, I'm for prayer. Please pray. Please pray. I am for speaking and declaring God's word. Nothing wrong with that. But please don't think it's a religious ritual that unlocks the blessings of God. No, that unlock was completed by Jesus, the great unlocker. Amen? What about going to church on Sunday at Hope Fellowship? Could Sunday morning at 10.30 be a bronze thing? I just show up so my fridge won't break next week. <laughs> Maybe God will reward my diligence. Maybe on the, the great celestial checklist, He'll give me a red check mark. You might get one of those scratch and sniff stickers too that you used to get in grade one. You remember those where they'd reward you with that? If you show up at 10.30 Sunday morning. And don't you dare leave before 11.50. Stick around. Do you see how it could easily become a bronze thing? Why do you do it? Well, I don't know. Granddaddy did it. Daddy did it. I do it. Let's give ourselves the solution here to the bronze thing. Well, guess what? Prayer is wonderful. But please don't put it as a religious obligation for yourself. No, don't put your eyes on self and what you do. Let prayer be an outflow of a heart that is set on Jesus. Amen? Amen? Let reading and speaking God's Word be an outflow of a heart that is set on Jesus. Let assembling together on Sunday morning or Wednesday night or Super Bowl party or whatever it is, let it be for the purpose of helping one another give our attention to Jesus. Amen. The songs that we sing, the sermon that we hear, the passages of Scripture that we read, the, the things that we communicate with one another over coffee before and after the service, let it be for the purpose of drawing people's attention to Jesus. Amen. Amen? What are your eyes open to? What are they open to? Looking at you and the past? Maybe past hurts, maybe past failures? Are they open to the way the world seems to go about things? Or are your eyes open to Jesus and all that He has done? Not all that He has done today. Are they open to the Spirit of God and the Word of God and what they accomplish in you and through you today? What are you giving your attention to? What are you giving your attention to? I close with a little self-test. I gave you the lesson, now I've got to give you the test. Maybe we can kind of give ourselves a checkup and say, well, if I'm, if I'm wondering, how am I doing with this giving my attention to Jesus thing? I like to say it this way. What's the first thing that comes to your mind in any given situation? That's kind of a good self-test for how we're doing in giving our attention to Jesus. Now, when I say how we're doing, I'm not saying we need to pass a test or accomplish something. No, it's just a good way we can kind of see, 
Yeah, how am I doing? What's the first thing that comes to your mind in any given situation? When a situation arises that in the natural you would logically fear, does fear come to mind first? Or does the presence and the very love of God come to mind? It's a good self-test. Not to condemn yourself and say, I got an F today, maybe I'll get a B tomorrow. No, forget about that. But for your own well-being and acknowledging the very love of God given to us through Jesus, how am I doing? What comes to mind first? When any challenge comes your way, do you say, I'm going to be flattened by this and it's over? What comes to mind first? When you wake up in the morning and there's a pain in your foot, you say, oh, I might be dead by the weekend. No. God loves me. It is His desire that I would be strong and be in health. Amen. What comes to mind first? Good things, I trust. As we continue to simply grow in what God has done for us. How many of you know we're all on a journey? I like what the Apostle Paul says. He says, to the degree that we have already attained, so let us walk. So wherever you are today, how many year, however many years you've known the Lord, or however many minutes you've known the Lord, whatever it is you've come to know and believe concerning His love and His favor and His grace extended to you, live accordingly. Live accordingly. Think according to what He has done. Give your attention to Jesus, for your eyes have been opened to Him. And now on a day-to-day -day basis, well, do I keep my eyes open? To him. His love is extended to us always. His grace is always extended. He is called the very wisdom of God made known to us. So we give our attention to him. And even as the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians, he says, God works in you to will and to do for his good pleasure. Give your attention to him. And what did we say before? Out of what we know of him, faith rises. And we are inspired to act in accordance with who He is and what He has done. And we'll find what? As we follow that leading of the Spirit of God, guess what you find? Within your life, you find the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. All these good things manifested within and working in us and through us. Not because we try to have the fruit of the Spirit, but because we have the Spirit of God present with us. And we give our attention to Him, and He's free to work in and through you for His good pleasure. Amen. Amen. Amen? Holy Spirit, I thank You that You are the one who opens our eyes to the knowledge of Jesus. Lord, as we hear Your Word communicated, even as we consider Your Word in, in, our, in our own lives, as we open our Bibles or, or flip it open on the computer, however we go about it, Holy Spirit, You are the great teacher. You are the one who calls our attention to Christ in all things. You are the one who makes known to us the very goodness of God revealed through Jesus and all that He has done. Father, we're so thankful that when the problem arose long ago, You didn't pack up and leave. You didn't dismiss us all and say, Be gone. Thank You that Your plan was in place already. That the eyes of our understanding, though they were open to sin and death and self, they've been opened now to the knowledge of Your love revealed through Jesus. Help us each day, Holy Spirit, to be mindful of Christ. And I thank you that as we give our attention to you, there is that renewal of our mind, that ever-increasing faith comes as we continue to grow in your grace revealed to us through Jesus. We're thankful for today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Come on up, sir. Why don't you give the Lord a good hand of appreciation here today?